Airway Management, Chapter 10. Primary component of caring for patients is ensuring that they can breathe adequately. That is a major part of our jobs. We have to be good at it. We have to recognize when our patients are breathing well. We have to recognize when they're not breathing well. We have to know that when breathing is disrupted, oxygen delivery to cells is compromised. That's obvious, right? We're not moving oxygenated air in as our, as our patient inhales. Therefore, there is not oxygen available for gas exchange in the alveoli and our patient's oxygen level is depleted. What they have existing in their blood over time is depleted and our patient's condition deteriorates accordingly. The first organ to be impacted and fail to function normally is going to be the brain. As the brain is oxygen deprived, level of consciousness decreases, your patient ceases to be conscious, and then your patient further deteriorates neurologically. Brain cells die. You don't rejuvenate dead brain cells. We know from CPR that after four to six minutes, brain tissue dies, resulting in irreversible brain tissue damage. The, and let's say that we're able to restore ox, ventilation and oxygenation maybe five minutes into an, a respiratory arrest. By then, should probably be a cardiac arrest also. We restore ventilation to our patient and we're able to, quote, resuscitate, close quote, our patient. Our patient has had significant brain tissue death at normal room temperature unless your patient is in an extremely cold environment. This four to six minutes will bring about massive irreversible brain tissue death. And obviously, we've discussed this several times. Now we're going to do it again. Oxygen is around us in ambient air at 21%. We inhale that 21% oxygen through the active process of ventilation. Intercostal muscles contract and our diaphragm flattens out. That contraction of intercostal muffle, muscles moves our chest up and out at the same time that diaphragm flattens out and that creates a pressure gradient because now the pressure in that enlarged thoracic cavity is less than the air pressure around us so oxygen oxygenated air moves in it makes its way through the upper airways, uh, past the larynx, down through the lower airway, goes down the trachea, hits the carina where right and left divides and goes down the right main stem bronchus, the left main stem bronchus, down through the bronchioles, down into the alveoli, those terminal sacs in the lungs that contain capillary beds and venules and that there's a capillary membrane there that oxygenated air hits that and we're at about 104 millimeters mercury pressure inside the the blood we have carbon dioxide at about 35 to 45 millimeters mercury there's a pressure gradient there so the oxygen moves in allowing the carbon dioxide to move out. And then that oxygenated blood is circulated throughout the body. We call that perfusion. Perfusing tissues is getting oxygen and nutrients down uh, into the capillary beds throughout the body. And that's how oxygen makes its way out into tissue. That's perfusion. If we have a patient with airway compromise, and we cease to be able to get oxygen down into 
the capillary beds of the alveoli and the blood doesn't pick up oxygen and we don't have highly oxygenated blood circulating around, we cease to perfuse tissue. When we cease to provide oxygen to tissue, those, those, those tissues, those cells, they switch to anaerobic metabolism. There is no new oxygen available and they attempt to survive on that for a time. Although that is a very inefficient uh, means of keeping keeping a cell alive. They they do their best to survive. We talked about earlier that those O2 molecules catch a ride on red blood cells because of the hemoglobin molecules that sit on the red blood cells. Four of them per red blood cell. Each one of those molecules can carry an oxygen molecule and they the the hemoglobin latches on to that oxygen and as it's circulated around the body it lets go of the oxygen releases that in uh, in tissues as it moves around then it circulates back around to the right side of the heart gets pumped out to the lungs to do it all over again right no new news there upper airway lower airway no new news there the division between the upper and lower airway is the larynx. We talked about this in the human body chapter. Everything above that is upper airway. Everything below is lower airway. Your patient has their oropharynx, their nasopharynx, and then collectively, posteriorly, we have the pharynx down to the larynx, through the larynx, down the trachea. And then that division that I was talking about, this point right here is called the carina, where the, the trachea divides into the right main stem bronchus, the left main stem bronchus. Then the smaller passages are the, the bronchioles, especially affected by asthma, and have inflammation and constriction. We'll talk a lot, of, a lot more about that later. And then we move on down through those bronchioles, the that gets smaller and smaller and smaller until we're down here in the alveolar sacs where red and blue connect here, right? Uh, where, where that connects, you have oxygenated blood on one side, deoxygenated on the other. And that's where our gas exchange is taking place. And we have hundreds of millions, if not more than that, uh, of alveoli, of these alveolar sacs. Just went through those. That's why you have a period of silence and me bouncing on through here. What does the nasopharynx do? It filters out dust and small particles. Uh, even the, the, the hairs in the nares, that's what we call the nostrils now. Since since we're medical folks, we call them the nares or nares. Uh, most most doctors pronounce it nares, so I do too. I want to sound smart, right? You got to hang out with the smart kids. You got to sound like them. So uh, even the even those hairs filter some dust particles. That's why you get crusties and crunchies on on those nose hairs as you breathe. Uh, some old men, they they have a really good filter. I, I'm starting to resemble that. Have to get the old weed whacker out and cut those suckers off. But then I'm putting more pressure on other parts of my nasopharynx to filter out the dust and small particles. It's where boogers come from, right? You have you have your nasal mucosa and you have the uh, the normal viscous fluid that is on the surface of that nasal mucosa. And as that dust and all that garbage comes in, it starts to make crunchies that can be picked and cause nosebleeds and lead us to go run ambulance calls on folks. It's great. We get calls off from all around. Another function helps warm and humidify air as it enters the body. Uh, body needs warm, humidified air. Cold air can trigger 
when cold air hits the larynx, that can trigger a cough reflex. And if you've ever taken a big, deep breath through your mouth on a really cold day, you know what I'm talking about. It can trigger a cough. Okay, let's hit something else right here. Uh, that oral pharynx, it goes two directions, right? We have the entrance to the, the esophagus when we swallow either food or liquid. And we also have that entrance into the respiratory system uh, and through the vocal cords. Between the vocal cords, we call the glottis, the muscular flap that folds over the, the vocal cords, over the glottis to protect our lower airway when we swallow food or drink is the epiglottis. Uh, it, is, it is fantastic. It does such a great job, but occasionally you'll get a, bit, a little bit of liquid or fluid past that epiglottis. Oh, what happens then? Yes, that cough reflex. Our body's going to fight to keep food or liquid out of our lower airway. If it makes it below there, we call it aspirating. Okay. Uh, Uvula, the little hangy down thing in the back of the throat, that's a landmark. Uh, okay. Uh, this, is a, this is anatomy. I probably shouldn't be wasting time with this, but I'm going to anyway. Thyroid cartilage, that big piece that makes up the superior part of the Adam's apple. Then you have the cricoid cartilage below that. Between the two is a membrane called the cricothyroid membrane. In case you wondered what this stuff looks like with the laryngoscope, think of this arrow is pointing anteriorly. So this is the front of our patient. We're coming down through their oropharynx with our laryngoscope, which is what we use to visualize and intubate a patient. This little muscular flap, that's the epiglottis. We have a couple of ways to move that with a laryngoscope, depending on which blade we use. This is ALS stuff, but you'll hear it talked about over and over, and I want you to be familiar with it. So we get that muscular flap moved anteriorly or up toward the front of the patient. And now what do we see? Oh man, we see vocal cords right here and right there between them, this little dark sliver that is the glottis. Through the glottis, we move on down to the lower airway. So I went out and found that picture for you guys. You're welcome. I just wanted you to see what it all looks like. Below the glottis, we've moved into the lower airway. We have the trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, alveolar, uh, the the alveolar sacs, uh, the alveolar sacs are contained within the tissue of the lungs themselves. Uh, and uh, that's good enough. Okay. The carina is the place where we divide, where the trachea splits and it moves into the right main stem bronchus, the left main stem bronchus. Bronchi, they are supported by cartilage. So you, those cartilaginous rings that we have in our trachea, those continue on at the carina and on down the bronchi. Uh, bronco, bronchi, of course, is one, that's how we move, we move oxygenated air down to the lungs and to the alveolar sacs. And that's also how we exhale and move the deoxygenated air out. Looks kind of like that. I like my picture better. Tracheobronchial tree. Holy crap, buddy. What would you just say? Trachea, bronchi, and then bronchial splitting out. Man, that gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you have that little microscopic termination known as an alveolar sac. Okay, bronchioles are made of smooth muscle. 
they dilate and constrict as oxygen passes through and then the very smallest terminal portion of the bronchioles connect to alveoli. So way down here where we can't see anymore. In asthma, a patient has an inflammatory response in those bronchioles. At the same time, they have a constrictive response in that smooth muscle in the in the, I mean, in the bronchioles, I said bronchi, in the bronchioles. So they have an inflammatory response in the bronchioles. And they have, at the same time, smooth muscle contraction within those bronchioles. So that makes those air passages smaller and smaller and smaller as that squeezed down and filled up with inflammation. So we have to engage medications to cause bronchodilation. Bronchodilation, we use a, a beta-2 agonist drug, which we'll talk about on Thursday. Uh, that causes bronchodilation. It relaxes that smooth muscle. And then we're going to be able to ventilate our patients. Patients are going to feel much, much better. Mediastinum, that's the space between the two lungs. What's there? The heart, the great vessels, meaning the aorta as well as the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. The esophagus also sits there, the trachea, and the largest portion of the bronchi is up there in the mediastinum, and then there's a collection of nerves in the mediastinum. Why are we even talking about that? Sounds like doctor stuff. When we learn about a pneumothorax or air accumulating in the thoracic cavity and that simple pneumothorax, meaning air accumulating in the thoracic cavity between the chest wall and the lung, as that fills up, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We start to call that attention pneumothorax after it starts to encroach on the mediastinum and interfere with the great vessels the, and the, the heart and the trachea. That is called a mediastinal shift. If you were looking at an x-ray with a physician and you were trying to determine if your patient had a simple pneumothorax or a tension pneumothorax, you would hear them say, I, the mediastinum seems midline. I don't see a mediastinal shift. Therefore, we have a simple pneumothorax, provided that we don't have anything, any indication of poor perfusion, such as the blood pressure falling, uh, tracheal deviation. Those kinds of things, that tension pneumothorax. Remember in patient assessment, we talked about assessing to see if our patient's trachea is midline. Why do we care? In a severe tension pneumothorax, you will occasionally see tracheal deviation. The As that shift in the mediastinum pushes through, pushes through, pushes through, you can start to see possibly the trachea start to deviate. Very, very rare that you see that. It is a late sign. But something you might see is jugular venous distension. Why do we talk about that? If this mediastinum is being shifted, let's take a garden hose. Not literally, but picture a garden hose with water coming out of it. And you take that garden hose, you hold one hand like this on the garden hose, the other one like that, and you start to push your bottom hand over and over and over. Eventually, you start to kink that garden hose. What does that do? That disrupts flow from above so that you don't have as many gallons per minute or liters per minute moving through that garden hose anymore. So now let's picture the great vessels. Let's picture the superior vena cava. 
that garden hose of a tube is coming down and you have that mediastinal shift and it starts to crimp that off, what happens to the blood that would be normally draining from the head and the upper, the upper torso? It can't drain as well, right? So that puts pressure back into the system, and that's what causes distended jugular veins. So that's why assessing for jugular venous distension is important. All right. It's worth mentioning here just so you can tie patient assessment together with this. The respiratory system and the cardiovascular system work together. The cardiorespiratory system, uh, the, cardi the cardiac system the ca moves deoxygenated blood out to the lungs to be oxygenated. Once it's oxygenated, then that is circulated back to the left side of the heart. And now you have oxygenated blood to move through the left atrium down to the left ventricle, pumped out the aorta, and then distributed throughout the body. Ventilation, air going in and out. That's all it is. That doesn't mean anything good is happening for our patient oxygenation, what we have also called alveolar respiration. Oxygenation takes place when oxygen molecules are loaded onto hemoglobin molecules in the bloodstream. Then respiration, that is that gas exchange out in the tissues so that the tissues get the oxygen and nutrients that they need and the carbon dioxide and waste products are moved away from that tissue. Okay, uh, like I said, this is an active muscular, uh, active muscular process to move air in and out. We don't suck air in and out. We create a pressure gradient and air moves in and out. When it goes out, all those muscles, active muscles and breathing relax and that reverses that pressure gradient and that deoxygenated air goes out and then we repeat the process, right? So let's remember a couple of things we talked about the other day. Uh, tidal volume in milliliters or cc's the tidal volume is the amount of air that moves moves in and out in one breath. Dead space is that portion not involved in gas exchange. So that'd be everything from the alveoli up, right? So if we have a tidal volume of 500 milliliters, that dead air space could be 150 milliliters of that or more. Okay, we talked about how exhalation takes place. Regulation of ventilation. What in the heck controls this whole thing? Our body, as we talked about the other day, it's regulated and maintained by a complex series of receptors and feedback loops. In modern motor vehicles, you have sensors that sense things like how much Oh man, what am I looking for here? How much fuel pressure is available? A sensor for uh, how much, uh, a CO2 sensor, how much carbon dioxide is left, I mean CO sensor, how much carbon monoxide is being emitted as uh, after combustion, that, that that sensor, there's also a CO2 sensor. Right? That is in the catalytic converter. This isn't auto mechanics, but you have the computer, you have the brain in the vehicle that gets information about, about how the vehicle is operating from these sensors all the time. Information coming back, going out, or adjustments that that computer is programmed to make to keep that vehicle 
running optimally, the optimal, uh, optimal running of the vehicle. Now let's apply that to people. We work the same way. We have receptors. We have baroreceptors that sense, uh, sense our blood pressure. We have chemoreceptors that sense the pH of our blood. Uh, in normal operation, normal functioning, the, the rate and depth of our ventilation is controlled in the medulla oblongata that is it's below the brain before you get to the spinal cord so if you picture the bottom of the brain and the spinal cord uh, the first couple of centimeters of your spinal cord is your medulla uh, if I had one in class I could show you I don't own a, own a human brain obviously not not one not a single one not in my head not anywhere but in normal operation CSF or cerebrospinal fluid bathes the the central nervous system the brain and the spinal cord and that covers also that medulla and that cerebrospinal fluid has a pH whether it's acidic or 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 alkalinic we operate normally slightly on the acidic side of the pH scale we're around 7.35 to 7.45 we're gonna call it 7.4 would be perfect so when the pH of the cerebrospinal fluid gets too acidic those chemo think a chemical those chemo receptors pick up on that and they adjust the rate and depth of respirations accordingly so that is what chemo receptors do it's a feedback loop uh, excuse me for patients with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, they all they operate with too much CO2 in their blood. They have too much carbon dioxide, which pushes them on the acidic side even more than normal all the time. And the body rocks along and it says, you know what? This seems to be the normal state of affairs. And usually, I would adjust my rate and depth of respirations to get this back so that we're getting back to that 7.4. But that's not working now because we don't breathe right anymore. We don't breathe like normal. So hypoxic drive, your, the body flips and starts to control the rate and depth of respirations based on the pressure, the partial pressure of oxygen in, in, circ in circulation in the body. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry about that. Okay. Dang it, I can't make it go. There we go. Okay. Just because air is going in and out does not mean that alveolar respiration or oxygenation is taking place. Uh, it could be that there's not enough oxygen present in order to have diffusion so that oxygen is loaded into the bloodstream. Uh, so and then uh, let's see what's another instance it could be that this patient's breathing in and out but because of left-sided heart failure blood is backing up into the alveolar sacs and some of that plasma is being pushed out across that alveolar membrane and now you have a blockage that's interfering with oxygen 
making its way down into those alveoli and our patients can decompensate and die quickly if that happens. So respiration, we have actual exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide at the alveolar level and also out in the tissues of the body. More pictures of it. Internal respiration, your book, that's what your book calls the delivery of oxygen and nutrients out in those capillary beds and getting that out to the cells in the, in the tissues of your body and then carrying carbon dioxide and waste away. So these would, this would be venules and, and capillaries connected. Uh, with that gas exchange taking place out into the tissue. Time is of the essence, they say in legal contracts. Time is very much of the essence with respiration, with perfusion, perfusing tissues. Uh, hypoxic patient, uh, zero to one minutes, Cardiac irritability, zero to four minutes, brain damage likely, four to six, brain damage possible, six to ten, it's more than brain damage likely, unless, unless they're in cold water, it's just dead gum near certain, and more than that, you have irreversible brain damage. What happens with cardiac irritability? With cardiac irritability, the... Remember I talked about automaticity and all those heart cells being able to take over and pace the heart. As the myocardium, as those cells and those muscle cells in the heart get irritable, they'll start firing a little electrical impulse because they think they're going to die. So I'm going to take over and run the show. Bam, there's an electrical impulse. Another one says, no, bam, there's another one. And you get those things firing and eventually that that devolves into ventricular fibrillation, which you will remember is one of the two rhythms that we use the AED to attempt to shut down so that the normal pace, electrical pacing of the heart can take over, right? Okay, chemoreceptors I mentioned. Uh, okay, let me do it this way. Uh, hydrogen ions, the, the pH, percentage of hydrogen ions in CSF as detected by chemoreceptors in the medulla are the primary respiratory drive. It's the backup to that if we have, for instance, that patient with emphysema or chronic bronchitis that I mentioned, that COPD patient chronic obstructive pulmonary disease we have they they live with a high level of carbon dioxide and a low pH carbon dioxide and pH work opposite of one another so if carbon dioxide is high too high pH starts to get low uh, and in that instance we have, the, hypo the hypoxic drive, which actually is a baroreceptor, that hypoxic drive takes over. Baro means pressure. So it senses that the pressure is out of whack. The pressure of partial pressure of oxygen versus the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. When that's out of whack, those baroreceptors jump in the game and try to... Uh, be a backup that that wins the game for us, right? They may not be uh, Drew Brees starting the game might be his backup, but they have to come in and win the game. I didn't pick Drew Brees to be controversial because there's controversy about Drew Brees right now, which is ridiculous, but there's controversy about Drew Brees, and I didn't pick it, pick his name for that purpose. He was the first quarterback that popped in my head. So, all right, disclaimer there. VQ mismatch or ventilation to perfusion 
mismatch. I'm not going to spend much time here, but I want you to understand what it is. A VQ mismatch, ventilation perfusion mismatch, either means we're not getting enough oxygenated air down in the alveoli or we're not getting enough blood around to those capillary beds in the alveoli for alveolar respiration to take place. So it could be a ventilation problem. Uh, our patient has a head injury and he's having long periods of apnea, meaning he's not breathing, long periods of apnea because of it, uh, then we're not getting oxygenated air down into those alveolar sacs so we don't have that supply of oxygenated air. Maybe we have that patient that I mentioned earlier who has left-sided heart failure, has congestive heart failure, that left ventricle isn't pumping enough blood out so the system backs up. It's a closed loop system. It backs up and that starts to cause blood to that oxygenated blood can't make its way down to the left ventricle and it's like your sewer being plugged up. It backs up and in this case, in the body, it backs that blood up into those alveolar sacs eventually. I, up through the, the, the pulmonary veins because they carry oxygenated blood to the left ventricle, up through the pulmonary veins, and then eventually all the way back up into those capillary beds in the alveoli, and then that plasma can push out across that alveolar membrane and then you can have all the oxygen in the world coming down there. But until you get that liquid out of the way, you are not going to perfuse your patient. Okay, there's a VQ mismatch. They still have a good strong pulse. They're circulating blood for now. But we can't oxygenate that blood. There's a VQ mismatch. Let's take it the other way. Our patient has very little blood pressure. And we can't do anything to fix it. We've tried everything we have. ALS is on the way to do their tricks. They still have a pulse, but they're not, they're not, they don't have very good stroke volume. Their minute volume uh, is, no, minute volume is respirations. Their cardiac output, sorry, their cardiac output is down because they're not, they don't have the stroke volume to move very much blood out. So, the milliliters of blood per contraction go way down. So we're not circulating as much blood around. We're providing lots of oxygen down there, but there's no blood coming around to pick that oxygen up and carry it on out to the body. So that is a ventilation to perfusion mismatch. All right. Know this, if there is a VQ mismatch, uh, we're going to identify, hopefully identify, that our patient is in severe distress and we're going to try to find a way to fix it. Uh, maybe we get a paramedic to infuse some fluids. Maybe all we, all we have to do is provide skinny pedal on the right gasoline or diesel therapy to our patient. What does that mean? Get to the hospital as fast as you can while doing chest compressions if they get to that point or providing positive pressure ventilation with 100% O2. We're trying to hold them over till somebody can do something to keep this patient alive. So severe hypoxemia can occur. That's a wrong statement. Ventilation with a VQ mismatch, if it's allowed to persist, severe hypoxemia shall occur, it will occur. We're going to use a definitive statement there. Our job is to try to keep it on the may occur side, right? We don't want it to occur. That's why we're coming to this class and learning all this stuff to try to keep people alive until they can reach definitive care. You thought you were going through this just so you could pass your national registry. Get out of the fire academy and go be a, go be a fireman. Probably 80% or more of your fire calls will be EMS calls. So... You have to learn this stuff. You have to be good at it. 
If you're going to be a good fireman, you better be a good EMT so that you take good care of your patients. All right. Uh, obviously, your patient has to have a patent airway, right? Uh, that would be, uh, I mean, that's, that's number one. If the airway isn't open, we can't do anything else, right? Intrinsic factors that would affect the delivery of oxygen all the way down to the alveoli. Infectious processes, inflammatory processes. You, patient has pneumonia. They have bilateral pneumonia. They have pneumonia in all five lobes of their lungs. Holy crap, this ain't good, folks. And I mean, I don't think it's really like this, but picture lungs full of pus from infection and we can't get oxygen, oxygenated blood through to those to the to the capillary beds because there's too much pus around there squeezing those down that's not exactly how it works but if you picture that you probably get pretty aggressive in in providing ventilation for your patients who have pneumonia in fact my description was way off but you can think of it that way we've got to get oxygen to those people they need antibiotics. They may even need, need to be intubated if their pneumonia is bad enough. Uh, put on the ventilator at the hospital. Have IV antibiotics. Uh, stuff can kill you. That would be an infectious process. An allergic reaction. The, the bee stung me. Well, I'm allergic to bees personally. I really am. Bees and wasp stings. And I've had a couple of run-ins with the little beggars. So my immune system is sensitized big time. So if I am stung by a bee, I'm going to be scrambling to get my EpiPen because next comes the hives, the upper airway swelling, the inflammation in my bronchi so that they squeeze down, and I'm fixing to die. That's that good old Texas medicine. He's fixing to die. He got stung by a bee. What do we do? We better fix it. That's why we're here. And we're going to talk about a little pharmacology in our next lecture so we get an idea of how to treat that. So, uh, And then tongue obstruction. Remember, that's the number one obstruction of the airway. We use an oropharyngeal airway or a nasopharyngeal airway to move that tongue out of the way and ventilate our patients, right? Uh, trauma. Massive chest trauma can cause injuries to the lungs themselves so that you you couldn't ventilate, you can't ventilate the patient. You can't get air down there because there's too much blood and mangled tissue. And if you got it down there, there wouldn't be any respiration because everything in the lungs is damaged to the point that, that there can't be any gas exchange. What do we call those people? Dead. We call them corpses. Do you have a funeral home preference for your husband, ma'am? That is the obvious end question that somebody is going to have to ask. First, they say, I'm so sorry. We've done everything we can do for him, and he did not make it. All right. Uh, foreign body airway obstruction. Uh, all the restaurants have been closed. I've been dying to go out to Hofbrau, my favorite steakhouse. Go out to Hofbrau and have a big old steak like I can afford one. I've been saving up my money because I want to go out to eat a steak. And the first night I go out there and I'm so excited that I'm eating this steak. I cut off too big a piece. I take a bite. Somebody says something funny. I suck that piece of steak down and it lodges in my oropharynx. I have a foreign body airway obstruction. Are we going to get air past that if we try to ventilate me now? No. That is blocked. I'm going to stand up, give the universal sign. I'm going to put my hands on my throat. And then give me 30, 60 seconds, somewhere in between there. I'm probably going to become unconscious and unresponsive. And if you leave me that way for four to six minutes, then I will have severe brain damage. You keep me that way for a little bit longer. Uh, and I'm going to be dead. And somewhere in there, my heart muscle itself, those cells are deprived of oxygen long enough that they get irritable and they all start firing. And then eventually I'm in V-fib. So now I don't have circulation. I don't have ventilation. And soon I ain't going to have nothing because dead people, you don't get to take it with you. They say that all the time, right? So I'm losing all my stuff. I can't take it with me. Don't let me go there. You got to save me. You got to do the Heimlich. You got to do something. 
call ALS to come use some McGill forceps and pluck that piece of steak from my oropharynx so that I don't die. I've gotten to do that before, pluck that piece of steak out of someone's oropharynx. Man, I was the hero of the day. They thought I'd done something miraculous. That's one of the easiest things in the world. I can teach you in five minutes. But don't tell anybody. That's one of those paramedic secrets that we ain't that great after all, huh? You have to be able to recognize it. You have to be able to do it. I could get you there pretty quick. All right. External factors. Atmospheric pressure. At high altitude, is there less oxygen? No, there's the same amount, 21%. If you go to 30,000 feet, there is 21% oxygen. What is different? The atmospheric pressure. So the partial pre pressure of oxygen is lower, which decreases that alveolar respiration. I'm not getting as much oxygen in because there's not as much ambient pressure around me to move that oxygen. So that 104 millimeters mercury goes down to, let's say maybe, oh, it's 90 now. Oh man, we got a problem, right? That's so over time, if you're acclimated, your body can learn to deal with those changing pressures up to a point and eventually reach a point where there could be no gas exchange because there is no pressure gradient, right? Okay, internal factors, pneumonia, pulmonary edema, that's fluid in the lungs, COPD and emphysema, that's uh, in emphysema, the, the alveoli become stiff, they don't contract very well, they become stiff, so they don't work as well, and you, emphysemic patients can't move air out of the alveoli well enough, and that causes hyperinflation of the alveoli. Uh, if you were to percuss the chest of someone with emphysema, take your fingers and tap on a finger on the other hand, it's hyper resonant. It rings like a drum when you're tapping on a drum head. I'm a drummer. I can tell you that what that feels like. You know what that feels like. You can if you thump on your finger and it's on a disc, it goes boom, boom, boom. If you put it, if you put that one of your fingers on an empty can that Quaker Oats come in and you put your finger on there and you tap on that and it rings a little bit more. That's hyper resonant. That's what you would find with the chest of an emphysemic and now I've told you why. Okay, other things, blood loss. We just don't, we have a circulatory problem. We just, our patients bled out and there's not available blood to send up to the, uh, up to the, are down to deep deep down in there to those alveolar sacs anemia that is a decreased red blood cell count uh, it could be uh, from the form of blood cancer it could be from a slow gi bleed over time you lose red blood cells become anemic oh crap now we have less red blood cells so we have less hemoglobin available to pick up that oxygen and give it a ride, right? So that is anemia. Hypovolemic shock. We've lost a massive amount of blood and we're not circulating that blood around uh, to the alveolar sacs, to those capillary beds. Or vasodilatory shock. What the world? A patient who has, they have septic shock. Uh, they have systemic throughout their whole body an infectious process eventually the toxins from that infection build up to the point that they bam they cause massive vasodilation we don't have enough fluid to fill up the pipes anymore the pipes just got too dang big on us not enough fluid to fill it up therefore we don't have the pressure to pump the blood around to the capillary beds and the alveoli. So respiration diminishes and eventually ceases, right? That, that alveolar respiration can't take place. Uh, and then another uh, 
and then psychogenic shock, hear bad news, and that slams the, ner the, the autonomic nervous system in a few people, causes massive, causes massive vasodilation, that person passes out. Good news is that is a transient process that's going to reverse itself pretty quickly. Another time you have massive vasodilation would be in, in anaphylaxis. You have that, that systemic massive allergic reaction and that causes massive vasodilation in a full in in full blown anaphylaxis, and we don't have enough liquid to fill up the pipes anymore because the pipes just got too big. So, the blood pressure tanks, the amount of blood that we have available to pump out to the body decreases. That would also decrease the amount of blood that we have available to send out to the lungs for oxygenation. Okay, things to recognize in patient assessment. Uh, I'm not going to take a break because you guys can take your own break by pausing this video anywhere. So I'd normally pause here, but I am going to keep on trucking. Uh, normal respiratory rates 12 to 20 a minute in an adult, right? If it is faster than that, or if it's slower than that range, with signs of poor perfusion, we need to provide positive pressure ventilation for our patients, all right? We're going to take over the rate and depth of, of ventilation for that patient with 100% O2, and we're going to deal with this problem that they have. All right. Uh, if our patient has a very irregular breathing pattern, uh, they and... I, could, I can't draw a picture of it on the board, obviously. We'll talk about irregular patterns later, but if they have an irregular breathing pattern, we have to take over, provide positive pressure ventilation to keep that patient alive until someone can determine what is causing that irregular breathing pattern. It could be that our patient has a closed head injury and blood is accumulating around the brain, that tra a traumatic brain injury, and that's compressing the tissues of the brain, and that's starting to put pressure on the medulla, and because the brain is starting to push down through the foramen magnum and put pressure on that brain stem uh, and on the medulla, and that starts to cause problems, and that interrupts that normal rate and the normal pattern of inhalation and exhalation, and we have to take over and manage that with our patient until we can get our patient to the hospital. This patient may need a, a neurosurgeon to take them down and deal with this bleeding in their head or evacuate that blood that's accumulated in that subdural hematoma or that epidural hematoma. Uh, we assess that to see whether that's happening. We watch to see if there's a regular rise and fall of the chest, right? Is there adequate tidal volume? Are they taking in enough air with each breath and exhaling enough air with each breath? So when do we, when do we bag our patients? When, right, you got it, I heard you, right? when they're breathing less than 12 times a minute, more than 20 times a minute, with signs of poor perfusion, or when there is an irregular rhythm. Uh, we treat our patient with positive pressure ventilation, uh, and that is with a bag valve mask. Uh, diminished, absent, or noisy, auscultated breath sounds. Some of those we can treat, some of them we can't. We're probably going to need ALS to treat those if we can't uh, suction the upper way, upper airway, and maybe they can cough some of the stuff up. For the most part, we probably need to recognize it, provide positive pressure ventilation, and maybe, just maybe, that will force some of that fluid that's accumulated down there in those alveoli. Maybe it'll push that back into the tissues and that will allow for that alveolar respiration to take place again. We're gonna look for chest rise and fall. 
do we have equal or unequal chest rise and fall? That tells us something. Is it too shallow? Is it super deep? If it's super deep, that may tell us that they that they have a, a head injury uh, or neurologic uh, some sort of some sort of trauma affecting them neurologically. We'll do a lot more of that at the end of the semester. Uh, are they pale? Are they cyanotic? Is there is there do they have altered mental status? Is their level of consciousness decreasing? Are they agitated? Are they combative? All those can be signs of poor perfusion that would go with abnormal breathing. Those are things to watch for. Remember that confusion and agitation are early signs of hypoxia. They could be signs of other things too, but those are early signs of hypoxia. This is what I would have drawn on the board, except for I would have drawn it better. But this is a pattern, a breathing pattern called Shane Stokes respirations. You see it in a patient who's had a stroke or had a head injury, sometimes in a dying patient, someone who uh, has been without oxygen long enough that they have enough, uh, enough of a hypoxic insult to their medulla oblongata uh, and to the pons, which are other structures uh, that are near the brainstem. Uh, we see this, they, they start off by taking shallow breaths. <sighs> And then there's a long period of apnea. And then shallow. And then it crescendos, like music. Crescendos, then day crescendos. Then there's a long rest, just like in music. And eventually, those periods of apnea get longer and longer and longer. And the depth of the inspirations and expirations get more and more and more shallow and it, so if somebody was a hospice patient and you were watching them die this is what quite often you would watch they they start to have this breathing pattern you start to have those long periods of apnea and eventually they're they're apneic and then they're pulseless and then they have passed from this life to the next Ataxic hey, respirations we'll talk about when we do head injuries. Uh, that's uh, a ir very irregular, irregular pattern that goes with uh, serious head injuries and strokes. Uh, Two small respirations. So patients uh, have a, a diabetic patient who is in diabetic ketoacidosis. Talked about that briefly this morning in the lecture. They're trying to blow off carbon dioxide to deal with this acidotic state that their body is in. And they're also blowing off ketones, which are a byproduct of the body metabolizing fat. And those ketones have kind of a fruity odor, maybe kind of like fruit that's starting to rot, but not completely rotted. I don't know. Different people describe it different ways. Uh, assessment of respiration. Uh, SpO2 is okay. It's better than nothing. If you have in tidal CO2, that is your best indication of respiration and perfusion. If they're between 35 and 45 millimeters mercury of, of pressure in that in tidal volume uh, of air, if that's how much CO2 is there, then that patient is they're they're perfusing normally. Okay, level of consciousness and skin color; those are your quick signs. Uh, pulse oximetry uh, below ninety four. Currently, we're going to deliver oxygen. We're going to make sure they have an open patent airway. We know how to open that. We've done it. In CPR, now we've talked about it in lab also. You use Fred the Head to look at that. Dentures, what do we do with those suckers? If they're in place, they're solid in place, that is going to help maintain an airway 
by maintaining that face shape. It also helps us get a mask, mask seal if we're going to ventilate our patient. We're going to leave those suckers in place. If those dentures are loose, they're going to eventually interfere with the airway. We take those out, put them in a safe place, hand them off to when we transfer patient care, we want to also hand off those dentures, glasses, anything like that that we have. But those dentures, those suckers are expensive. I mean, people sometimes have sometimes have dentures that cost four or five thousand dollars. Most people can't afford to shuck out shuck out another five grand. They had to go through something horrendous financially to to afford them, and we don't want to lose them. So be careful with those things. Make sure you hand them off. Document who you gave them to, and if you delivered upper upper plate, lower plate, both. That's important to cover your butt down the road when they're trying to find the dentures. You don't want the service you work for having to buy some new dentures for those folks because somebody's going to, and if you documented it, it puts it inside that hospital somewhere, right? Uh, blood, we have to suction that out of the way. Vomitus or emesis, we have to suction that out of the way. Mucus, we have to suction that out of the way. Get those chunks of, of beef stew, get the chunks of beef out of there. If you have to pull that that yonker tongue, yonker tip suction that 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 uh, that uh, suction catheter off of the hose, crimp the hose, cram the hose down in the airway, and then release the crimp so it starts suctioning the big chicken noodle soup that's in your patient's oropharynx, do it. You got to get it out of the way. So hopefully that painted a good enough picture for you to see what you need to do. And then other foreign objects. Maybe somebody had a, they had a straw that they'd been chewing on and it used to be a nice sonic straw, red. It was pretty good, had a pretty good size lumen in it. Pretty long straw because they had a had a Route 44 drink, and they started chewing on that because they were nervous or because it was just a habit, or they thought it was fun, and they chewed that up, but then they had it in their mouth chomping on it, and then they had a wreck, and that piece of sonic straw went back and blocked their oropharynx. We have to get that sucker out of the way. You know how to do the head tilt chin lift. You know how to do the jaw thrust maneuver. The thing I'll point out, we're going to use the jaw thrust maneuver anytime and every time we suspect C-spine trauma. You know that. We've done that. If you use your fingers to open a patient's teeth, make sure that you don't end up having a piece of your finger or your thumb as another foreign body airway obstruction. They will bite you. And they can bite a finger off. So be careful. I would recommend not sticking your fingers in somebody's mouth. And if you do, I didn't say this, but I'm going to because I want you to keep all your fingers. I don't want you to look like you work in the oil patch. I want you to look like you work in EMS. Those little orange bite blocks that we used the other day in in airway adjunct lab to push the tongue down and and slide the oropharyngeal airway in. I don't even think we're supposed to do this anymore, but I want you to have all your fingers and your thumbs. So pry, pry their mouth open and put that little plastic bite block, the fat end, the heavy end, in between the molars. A bite block, that's what that's for. And then you can reach in and you can grab something out if you see it. If you don't see it, don't try to grab it. All right, enough of that. You know how to suction. You know what you use to suction. We have to keep that oropharynx clear so that we can ventilate our patients or so they can ventilate yourselves, right? themselves, right? Uh, and I added a technique there for you, right? A suction technique. Pull that tonsil tip off, cram the hose in. Somebody's puking up voluminous amounts. You have them rolled on their side. They're puking, puking, puking. Then 15 seconds at a time in an adult, 
you can suction that vomit out with the hose if it has too big a chunks in it so that you can't get it out. Okay, you know what an OPA is. You know how to use it. Uh, the contraindication would be a patient with a gag reflex. I'm going to say one because a conscious patient is going to have a gag reflex, but your book says there are two, conscious patient and gag reflex are contraindications. NPA, we use those when we can't use an OPA, use it on a patient with an intact gag reflex. Even on a conscious patient, we could use that. When, when is that contraindicated, a patient with severe head injury with blood in the nose or uh, facial fractures? We're not going to put that sucker in because we don't want to cram that little rubber thing in somebody's brain which I don't think is probably possible, but we're not going to take the chance. Right, folks? All right. Recovery position on the side. When they puke, it goes to the side and it shoots out on your shoes. It's a fantastic thing. If somebody's on a backboard, they have C-spine precautions. They're strapped to that backboard. Their head, their body, everything, and they start to puke. What do we do? Because it's going to happen. We roll that board and all up on its side and they keep puking. What are we going to do? We're going to prop that backboard so that they remain on their side. That's why we strap our patients firmly to that backboard. We check motor sensory and circulatory in all four extremities because the backboard is a splint. But we prop them up there. We have suction ready. You have somebody with a bad, a bad closed head injury that can make them vomit and vomit and vomit and vomit. And But you need... To, to observe spinal precautions to protect your patient's C-spine. So C-spine, well, C-spine, T-spine, and L-spine, but mainly the C-spine, that would be the most unstable. So we prop that board up. They're firmly secured to that. We can keep oxygen on them, and then we can suction them out when they start puking. If we need to bag them, it's a little harder to bag them up on their side like that. It can be done, all right? It would also be a time to call for ALS if that's available because it's a whole lot easier to provide positive pressure ventilation to an intubated patient pop, propped up on their side like that than it is to try to get a good mass seal and ventilate them sideways and do all that cool stuff. But you may have to do it. Never, ever withhold oxygen from a patient who might benefit from it. But you said there's a hypoxic drive, and, and, and if the oxygen level gets too high, if they breathe off of a low level and it gets too high, they'll quit breathing. Oh, my gosh, they quit breathing. They quit breathing. I've heard personally two by now almost three generations of nurses freak out because I had a non-rebreather mask on my trauma patient or... My patient with COPD exacerbation when I'm bringing them into the ER because I'm trying to maintain their SpO2. I'm trying to maintain their alveolar respiration so that my patient is perfused. And they say, well, you put too much oxygen on them, then you're going to knock out their hypoxic drive and they won't breathe anymore. And my answer is, so freaking what? All right, why do I say, so freaking what? We have this magic little device called a bag valve mask. And we can use our magic little bag valve mask to ventilate that patient. So do not, do not, do not deprive your patient of oxygen when they need it. All right, I'll call them down a little... And I get excited about that one. Okay. Uh, you spent a whole lab the other day on supplemental oxygen equipment. I'm going to bounce through that. Uh, remember to handle O2 cylinders carefully. I've, I've never seen it personally, but I have seen pictures and I've seen a video of an O2 tank going through three walls before it stopped. I have a friend who personally witnessed an O2 tank, O2 tank fall over and knock the skinny end off the O2 tank and it shot through a cinder block wall to the outside. What would happen if you were between that wall and that what has now become a missile? You would have massive blunt force trauma. We don't want that for you. Okay, you know about the pin index system. 
you know what the regulator is for it steps down that that 300 pound 300 psi 200 psi regulates it down to maybe 30 40 70 psi then it's low enough we can put our flow meter on there and we can regulate how many liters per minute of oxygen our patients receive. Uh, remember that the percentage of inspired air, the FiO2, would be dependent on our number of liters per minute and the device that we're using to deliver that, right? Non-rebreather mask, we're going to push 90 plus percent at 12 to 15 liters per minute and then a nasal cannula at two liters per minute is going to give us about 28 percent right okay oxygen doesn't burn oxygen doesn't explode oxygen supports combustion so with oxygen present and a, and fuel and a spark you can have a big explosion but oxygen does not burn okay okay you know what a non-rebreather mask is you know what a bvm is you know what a nasal cannula is you know what they look like we run non-rebreather mask your book says 10 to 15 liters per minute uh, also, just go by enough to keep the reservoir inflated. Nasal cannula, the two little prongs go in the nose. At two liters per minute, we're going to get about 24%. At four liters per minute, we're going to uh, six liters per minute, we're going to get, no, 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 one liter per minute, we're going to get 24, 28, 32, 36. Yeah, one liter. That's wrong. Scratch that out, put one liter per minute. We'll keep Buddy honest here. And then 44%, we're going to need six liters per minute of FiO2 to achieve that 44%. We never, ever, ever, never, ever run an oxygen cannula above six liters per minute. If we need more than, more than 44%, we're going to go back to one of those bad boys. What if that isn't enough? We're going to use a bag valve mask connected to an oxygen supply. We want a bag valve mask with a reservoir so that we can provide close to 100% FiO2. Venturi mask. See these little plastic things? Those fit in that elephant trunk part of the Venturi mask. And you can change precisely the amount of FiO2 in that little snozzle there with changing out these little plastic things. These little plastic things also tell you how many liters per minute of flow rate it takes to achieve the FiO2 that you desire to deliver to your patient. All right. Uh, ranges from 24 to 40%. Those fell completely out of favor for a while. And four or five years ago, they started coming back. I've always liked them. I used to use them all the time. I preferred those over a nasal cannula if my patient could tolerate a mask because I knew what my FiO2 was. You also have a dang good I'll say dang because I'm not going to say another word on this recording. You have a dang good idea of your FiO2 with a nasal cannula anyway. Tracheostomy mask. We're almost done, folks. Tracheostomy mask. Someone who has a stoma. Where is a picture of a stoma? I don't have one. My kingdom for a stoma. Uh, somebody, let's say they had, had laryngeal cancer. They had cancer in their voice box and they had to have a laryngectomy. All that was removed, and they now have an opening into their trachea pretty close to where the carina is, just superior to the carina, I do believe. And they have a little tube that goes through that tracheostomy into their trachea just above the carina, and 
most of the time there's a little adapter. You want to know a trick about that little adapter? That little sucker, if we measure it in millimeters, our valve from our bag valve mask will fit over that because if you have a patient with the, with the tracheost tracheostomy, it will do no good to put a mask, a bag valve mask, over their face and try to ventilate them because we got to blow air in their neck. So we're going to pull the mask off, connect our valve with our bag valve mask to that ostomy tube coming out of their tracheostomy and we can ventilate them. That's also where we suction them. We get all the funkola out of that. We can pull that little tracheostomy tube out of the adapter that sits on the neck and we can suck that all out. That is endotracheal suctioning. Do not suction that more than, I'd say, 10 seconds. And better than that, know that you don't need to suction that more than 10 seconds or as long as you can hold your breath. But before you do that, contact online medical control and rest, request permission. Then when you document that in your PCR, you document that you requested an order and you received an order to suction the tracheostomy tube. Then your tail end is covered. More importantly, I think your patient has that obstruction that could interfere with you ventilating them, that's out of the way. Uh, sometimes you find patients, I think I have a picture in a little bit, I will do that later. Sometimes they don't have that adapter and that tube there, they just have a hole in their neck that they breathe through. And if you're going to put oxygen on them, you have to put an oxygen mask there. The same with this tracheostomy. Just take a non-rebreather mask and go and tie it around the neck so that you're provide, providing that oxygen right there at the tracheostomy tube. If you have to ventilate them and they don't have that adapter there, you can take an infant mask and you can push that down against the skin or maybe even a child mask, push that down against the skin so that you get a good seal and then you can ventilate them through that tracheostomy, all right? Okay, humidified oxygen, you ain't going to have it on your ambulance. Uh, we wish we did, but we don't. I guess it costs too much to have sterile water in a jug that fits onto your oxygen regulator and has a little connector for you to connect oxygen tubing to. That must be dadgum expensive because you don't ever have them. It's great for treating things such as croup in kids. Uh, long transport, uh, it is it is a ne necessity, but you're not going to have it. So you're going to dry out mucosa. You're going to cause a problem with your dry oxygen, but that's all you're going to have. So I uh, Sometimes, if you're picking a patient up in the hospital for a long distance transfer, they're on oxygen, they may have that little saline reservoir connected to the oxygen regulator in the hospital room. Little trick, if you're going to transport that patient a long distance, unscrew that thing, take it with you, Pull the oxygen supply tubing off of it. Be careful not to spill that sterile saline out of there. Connect them to your D-tank, your little portable dehumidified oxygen, just that dry stuff. It's horrible. And get them down to your ambulance. And when you get in your ambulance, unscrew the Christmas tree, that little green thing, off of your oxygen regulator. Screw that patient's humidification, that uh, that reservoir, that humidification reservoir, then what happens? Your dry oxygen in your ambulance goes through that water. It bubbles. It creates a mist. They breathe, And then that mist goes down through your oxygen tubing, your supply tubing, and your patient breathes it in, and you have solved a big problem. So do that. That is a great thing to do for your patients. Okay. You know how to, 
to do artificial ventilation, assisted ventilation. Their tidal volume is insufficient, so we're going to bag a system enough to get chest rise. Okay, that's the tidal volume. How often? We're going to shoot for a breath every five to six seconds, so that's 10 to 12 a minute, right? Don't get excited and, and generate too much tidal volume. You will put air in the gut, and you'll make them throw up, and then you have to wear it, and then you compromise, potentially compromise their airway. So, uh, okay. Don't wait too long to intervene and ventilate your patient. Respiratory distress, difficulty breathing, respiratory failure. We cease to have sufficient alveolar respiration. We don't have that gas chain exchange happening anymore. That's when it becomes failure. It could be that your patient is in respiratory distress using accessory muscles and they fight and fight and fight and fight and eventually just get tired and give out if you went and ran five miles i couldn't i can drive i drive five miles i get tired if you went and ran five miles then you would be extremely tired if you're using accessory muscles and you're fighting to breathe and fighting to breathe just like running eventually you're going to get too tired to run if you're running if you're fighting to breathe using accessory muscles to breathe eventually you're going to get too tired to fight and you're going to and you're going to stop breathing so let's help those patients out right if the rate's too slow if it's too fast with the indication of poor perfusion we're going to use positive pressure ventilation we provide that either with a bvm or we provide that with the cpap i'll show you a cpap in a minute all right Inadequate ventilation, inadequate perfusion, altered mental status, inadequate minute volume. What was minute volume? Tidal volume times respiratory rate per minute gives you minute volume. What kind of things get in the way of that? Uh, breathing too fast, breathing too slow, not breathing deeply enough. I saw where I ran two words together when I was rushing, rushing to juice up this PowerPoint. I'll fix it for the next class. I apologize. Okay, so what happens when you don't spell check? Okay, squeeze that bag enough to get chest rise and you're good. Uh, go for that uh, breath every five, uh, every five, five or six seconds. That'll give you 10 to 12 per minute. Uh, that's perfectly good uh, for assisting ventilations. Artificial ventilation, we're breathing for them, right? We use a BVM. You've done all that. You know how to do that. We're going to scoot right on through this. Um, when those ventilations are adequate, how do you know if your intervention is working? Remember from patient assessment, we're going to continuously assess and monitor our patients. If we have an ongoing intervention, we'll assess before and after the intervention, but we're going to have ongoing intervention where we're assisting ventilations with our patient their color is going to improve we get good chest rise we have good bag compliance what in the world it's not too hard to squeeze that bag we don't have a bunch of resistance with the bag we have good mask seal and we squeeze that bag enough to get chest rise and it's not real hard to squeeze now let's make that patient Let's say that patient has no respiratory effort whatsoever. They are apneic and we are bagging them and it is really hard to squeeze that bag. That can be a sign that, or a couple of things. Our patient could have severe gastric distension, which is interfering with our, It's and it's pushing up into the, and it's, encroaching on the diaphragm it's pushing up into the thoracic cavity all that pressure all that distended stomach and we have trouble pushing air down into the lungs with our bag that could be poor bag compliance or let's say our patient has a tension pneumothorax eventually that can cause poor bag compliance so that is something we always need to note when we're when we're ventilating a patient whether our bag compliance is good or not whether the resistance feels normal or there's just too daggum much of it right that's a precise medical term too daggum much 
Okay, TD, TDGM, too dead gum much. That's how we'll abbreviate our new medical term. And then you, you hear and feel air escape as the patient exhales. That's good, right? That's a BVM. You know how to run that sucker. You know when to do it. You know how to do it. Don't be afraid to do it. Be careful with gastric distension. I got ahead of myself again. Seems like I always do that. You'd think I prepare for these lectures and get excited about what I'm going to tell you and I get ahead. Yep, that's it. But I should control myself, right? Chill out and just deliver it when I get to it. Okay. Gastric distension is going to affect children sooner than it's going to affect adults. It will affect adults. If you bag too forcefully and too rapidly, too forcefully and or too rapidly, you will end up with a patient with gastric distension and that is going to decrease the amount of tidal volume you're going to be able to deliver to your patient. What else is it going to do? Your patient, okay, here we go. Air takes the path of least resistance, right? So when we fill that stomach up, we stand, distend it, distend it, distend it. Which is the path of least resistance? Out the pyloric sphincter into the small intestine, through the small intestine, down to the, to the cecum, out to the, to the large intestine, up, over, down, hit the rectosigmoid colon, then the rectum, through the anus, out to the world, or is the path of least resistance? up through the esophagus. Yeah, it's number two, up through the esophagus. And when that happens, not only does air come out, vomitus comes out, and you're on a high risk of your patient aspirating that vomit, and then you have created a major problem for your patient. That may occur anyway. Uh, they may have some gastric distension. Maybe somebody was doing mouth to mouth before you got to them and they were blowing too hard and there's massive gastric distension. What are we going to do? We have to be ready with the suction, right? We have to be ready to turn them to their side and suction them out. Okay. You know what to do. All right. I got excited there for a minute. I guess I'm, I must be passionate about aspiration. No, my aspirations are to avoid aspiration. How about that? All right. Hey, I know words have multiple definitions. Okay. Uh, passive ventilation. I'll briefly talk about this. If you have a way to do it, uh, if you're doing CPR on someone and there's not an advanced airway in that patient, they're not intubated, which you can't do. So if you're doing BLS CPR on someone, there is something called, called passive ventilation. We take a nasal cannula and put on our patient using one flow meter and we run that thing at six liters per minute. And then we have our bag valve mask connected to another, another flow meter and we have that running uh, at enough to keep that that reservoir reservoir inflated why am i doing that that's just like that's belt and suspenders why do you need both chest compressions create a pressure gradient in the chest and as those so if we're doing 30 to 2 chest compressions to ventilations because we don't have an advanced airway when we're doing 30 compressions, then two ventilations, we're creating a little pressure gradient as we do those chest compressions. And if we have a nasal cannula there through passive ventilation, we're going to provide a fairly rich amount of oxygen in the patient's upper airway, and some of that's gonna make it into the lower airway, and it might help. Studies have shown that it does help. So we're not going to go into all of those come to paramedic school. We'll talk about them a lot more. Okay, manually triggered devices. We don't use those much anymore. Uh, used to One of them was a demand valve. You put that sucker with the mask over and you get a good mask seal and you push this button and this stinking button delivers one liter of 100% oxygen every time you ventilate your patient.
Well, what is the normal tidal volume? Didn't we say in an adult it was around 300 to 350 milliliters? If you said yes, you were correct. We did say that. So we have just overpressurized our patient for no reason. We delivered way, way, way too much tidal volume uh, down in the alveoli. We can cause barotrauma. We can rupture those alveoli. They're like a little balloon and they can pop. So we rupture alveoli. That's barotra barotrauma. The other thing we do that, that happens, we just talked about that gastric distension. We keep putting air in, air in, air in, and there's mushed up, chewed up cheeseburger and malt. They had a whole large strawberry malt at at Whataburgers, that's 32, a 32 ounce malt. If you haven't ever, if you accidentally screwed up and ordered one of those, you would know. Or if you intentionally, that is a lot. And they ate a cheeseburger and they got a, and they drank a 44 ounce Diet Dr. Pepper. And then they had a refill and they drank another one. And then they went into cardiac arrest. And somebody started mouth to mouth on me, hopefully never, but started mouth to mouth on me over at the Whataburger by my house here at 34th and Coulter, and they're starting to get a little air in my gut. And then what if you came along and you got you had one of those manually triggered ventilation devices and you keep blowing air in my gut, you're blowing air in my gut, and you cause that gastric distension by air in my gut, I mean through my esophagus down into my stomach. And that thing, it stretches until there's so much pressure there She's got to blow, and like a whale in the ocean that exhales, and you have that big spout of water that comes up in all the old cartoons. That ain't how whales work either, but that big spout of water comes up on the whale in the ocean in the old cartoons, and my big spout of double meat, double cheese, Whataburger with sliced jalapenos, my French for large order, a French fries, and my... 32 ounce strawberry malt and my 64 ounces of Diet Coke that I managed to swallow down into my stomach, that comes out along with all that air and it sprays everywhere. It's all over you. It's all over the floor. It's on the guy behind the counter. It's just a horrendous sight and it's got that stinking red color from the strawberry malt in there so it looks like i'm blowing blood everywhere oh man what a sight huh what a mental picture let's avoid that let's use a bvm and ventilate enough to get chest rise because we do not want that scenario that i just described to play out because there is a good chance that i may end up aspirating some of that stuff as well okay do not use those in patients with copd We'll pop those little alveoli. They're stiff. They're not very flexible. Patient with emphysema. Pop, 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 pop. All those things pop like a popcorn popper when we're when we're blowing that big amount of tidal volume in there with this thing. Yeah, you can see now why these things have fallen out of favor in EMS. I Meaning we don't use these suckers anymore, right? Okay, last. Uh, oh, almost last. Uh, portable ventilators. Uh, automatic transport ventilator. Uh, we we'll use these on intubated patients, just like they use a ventilator in the hospital on intubated patients. It has less bells and whistles than the one at the hospital has. We have control over tidal volume, FiO2, uh, back pressure, also called PEEP, uh, several things like that. We have lots of control because these are, these are fancy little portable ventilators but, and your book says, I mean, this is a no hands deal, right? The ventilator ventilates that patient at the rate and tidal volume that is set. And it says this frees up the EMT to perform other tasks. Back to my two word response, bull crap. That exceeds your scope of practice. You cannot manage that transport ventilator legally. You need an AEMT, a paramedic, or a respiratory therapist, or somebody like a flight nurse who's trained to manage a ventilator to ride along with you, even if you're in the back in your ambulance, 
as the EMT, this is my truck, but there's a transport ventilator. You need someone whose scope of practice includes managing that ventilator. You do not do it. Refuse to do it. What if they yell at me? Refuse to do it. What if they yell at me more? Refuse to do it. Call your supervisor. Call your boss. Get somebody whose scope of practice includes managing that device to transport that patient. You're going to work hard for your certification. Don't throw it out the door by by doing something like that. It's just it's just crazy. Well, what if, but what if it? I'm in a small town, a small town hospital, and it's a guy I went to high school with, and we were on drumline together, and we've been buds since sixth grade when we started off in beginning band playing drums together. I don't care. You do not manage that transport ventilator. Okay, enough of that. I think I made my point. Okay, CPAP. Uh, I think you've seen one of these in lab. If not, we'll show you one. Uh, it's it's a type of positive pressure ventilation. Uh, people with sleep apnea, they sleep with these suckers on. I, I'd have to have sedation to make me go to sleep, I think, because I don't know that I could sleep with that thing on. Uh, they are widely used now. It is also a, a basic life support positive pressure ventilation device. It increases pressure down into the alveoli. It opens collapsed alveoli. It helps increase, increase pressure to help move oxygen across the alveolar membrane and into the blood so that hemoglobin can pick it up and circulate it around, just like we said 15 times today, right? You're tired of hearing me say that, aren't you? All right, pushes more oxygen across that alveolar membrane. And as I mentioned earlier, if we have interstitial fluid that is through pulmonary circulation has pushed its way across that alveolar membrane and it you have a VQ mismatch, right? You can't you can't get oxygen can't ventilate the patient to get oxygen past that 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 interstitial fluid and into across the the capillary membrane and into the bloodstream so that what we're going to hear it ad nauseum means you hear me say something till you want to puke but i want to make sure you get this we move that oxygen across the alveolar membrane into the into the blood so that what the, uh, the the on the red blood cells the hemoglobin can attach to that oxygen so it can be delivered out to the tissues of the body organs are comprised of common types of tissue we we provide that oxygenated blood out to those tissues and it moves out into the tissue and we call that perfusion right uh, yes, that is perfusion. That is a cool thing. Okay, it uses a face mask that straps to the patient's head. You get a good mask seal. Uh, be careful in using this in patients with low blood pressure. It can cause blood pressure to low it, lower even more. Uh, your patient needs to be alert and able to follow commands. They have to show signs of moderate to severe respiratory distress. Remember, we're trying to fend off respiratory failure. And we may be able to use this device to do that in the proper patient. Uh, patients breathing rapidly, their SpO2 is less than 90. Uh, we can put the CPAP on them and deliver oxygen and that oxygen, uh, the oxygenated air, it does a couple of things. It helps reinflate and maintain inflation of alveoli. Uh, there's a back pressure there called PEEP that we can set, positive end expiratory pressure that holds those alveoli open. Picture this, you have, you have all those millions of alveoli and let's say 30% of them are all collapsing every time your patient exhales, or they're just collapsed and they're not inflating at all. But we put some back pressure in there and all those little balloons blow up. So now with PEEP, you have that back pressure to keep them open. And then with that positive pressure 
from the CPAP that pushes that pressure down all the way to the alveoli with every breath those inflated alveoli receive that that oxygenated air more easily because you don't have to reinflate them and you provide that oxygen to cross that capillary membrane and and perfuse your patient right uh, contraindicated in respiratory arrest. If they're not breathing, we can't assist their respirations, right? Okay, uh, if they have chest trauma or a pneumothorax, which you're going to learn to identify later, but if they have chest trauma or a pneumothorax, uh, CPAP is contraindicated. We don't want to take a simple pneumothorax with a hole in a lung and start blowing oxygenated air out into the thoracic cavity and cause a tension pneumothorax. That's why we don't use it, all right? Uh, if someone has a tracheostomy, like we were just talking about, the hole in their neck that they breathe through, uh, we don't use a CPAP on them. If somebody has an active GI bleed or vomiting, we don't use that because we don't want them to vomit and then use our positive pressure ventilation to push that vomit all the way down into those alveolar sacs and cause pneumonia, we cause a VQ mismatch because we have that foreign liquid down there. It's just a bad thing. Or if they can't follow your verbal commands, if they have altered mental status, we can't use this sucker. Um, along with it, I mentioned this already, with CPAP, uh, you can, on most of them, you can dial in the amount of PEEP you want, positive end expiratory pressure. That's what's keeping those alveoli inflated. All those millions of little alveoli. You can picture them with me right now. You can close your eyes and see them. Those little globs of grapes looking down there that we're keeping those inflated with, we measure this in centimeters of water. Seven to 10 centimeters of water is an acceptable amount of back pressure or PEEP, end expiratory pressure, to hold those alveoli open so that it is easier to ventilate and then oxygenate our patients. Uh, complications. Somebody is claustrophobic, it can make them totally freak out, having that mask strapped to their face and sealed down to their face. Uh, if they have a risk of pneumothorax, uh, or there is a risk of pneumothorax, so what do we need to do? We need to continually reassess that patient. This is an inter intervention. Part of our ongoing assessment is every five minutes, we're going to auscultate breath sounds, and we're going to determine if those breath sounds remain equal bilaterally. If they're equal bilaterally, then I don't think my patient has a pneumothorax. We're good to go. Let's keep on keeping on, right? This is a good thing. If we look and our patient starts to have asymmetric chest rise, one side of the chest is going up, the other side isn't. Oh, but it hadn't been five minutes. I don't give a flip. You just had a change in your patient's condition, reassess, auscultate the breast sounds, and determine if your patient has developed a pneumothorax. Okay, they have. What do I do? You don't talk like that because you're a professional EMT who knows what he's doing or what she's doing when you're utilizing this intervention of positive pressure ventilation through your CPAP. So what are we going to do? We are going to DC or discontinue the therapy. We're going to get that mask off of them and we're going to start bagging them with the bag valve mask, being careful with our tidal volume, being careful with our rate. That's all we have to do. That's it, right? There's a picture of a stoma. I thought we had that sooner, but we didn't. So I've talked about that now. Uh, it's tracheostomy. That's how they breathe. Uh, often they'll have that little adapter strapped around, or there's like a tape seal that goes around that sometimes to hold that, that tracheostomy tube adapter in place uh, so that so that they can breathe uh, and 
some of them have a special little adapter there and because they don't have a larynx larynx anymore the only way they can talk is talk, it sounds like darth vader it's a computerized kind of sound doesn't sound anything like what i just did but they hold that box up to their stoma and they can just how do we talk we send different amounts of air through our vocal cords and they constrict and, and relax to provide the frequency of the sound so you don't get much sound frequency when somebody has a laryngectomy and they put up the little the little box to their stoma to talk but they learn to talk by controlling that airflow uh, they can't I couldn't do this lecture with one of those boxes if I had one of those but anyway all right what I do if I need to ventilate the patient uh, with the stoma we already talked about that we just use uh, we can ventilate them through their tracheostomy tube we suction as needed contact medical control for permission to do that endotracheal suctioning because you're down there in the trachea where that stoma is and then call for ALS uh, if you have a patient with a stoma who's in respiratory distress and ALS is available, call for them. You can either rendezvous with them on the way to the hospital or they can come to your scene or they can fly to meet you, but that patient is likely to need, uh, need ALS. Um, if they have a stoma but they, they aren't breathing, we can use an infant or a child mask to get a seal over that stoma and ventilate them. We could put a non-rebreather mask over that to to, to uh, provide to increase the FiO2 that we're delivering to them. You know how to manage foreign body obstruction, the Heimlich maneuver that we did the first, the, the second and third days of class. Uh, if your patient can still exchange air, if they can still talk, even if they have noisy breathing. Let them try to expel the object. They are likely to be coughing their heads off and gagging and gagging and coughing because those reflexes are stimulated. It's the body's way of trying to clear the airway. Uh, and they have poor, ex poor air exchange, decreased level of consciousness, uh, severe difficulty breathing, uh, expiratory strider, inspiratory strider, cyanosis, treat that with, uh, treat that immediately. You need to try to get that out of there. Call for ALS. Maybe they can remove the obstruction that's in the way. Um, if your patient becomes unresponsive and not breathing because of a foreign body airway obstruction, be begin CPR with chest compressions and hopefully the the chest compressions will help dislodge whatever's in the way. Call ALS. Maybe they can get the the culprit out of the airway. Maybe they can't, but we will always try. Okay. Um, dentures already talked about. Facial bleeding. We're going to control facial bleeding with direct pressure, and we're going to keep an eye out for bleeding into the airway. Uh, and if somebody is bleeding into the airway, if they have, if they're bleeding in their in their mouth or their posterior oral pharynx, maybe when they T-bone, maybe when they they uh, almost said a bad word, when they had the rear end collision and they were driving the car and they were texting and they had for some reason they were sucking on a marble, uh, people do crazy things. Maybe they had a marble in their mouth, bouncing around, sucking on a marble, and they, uh, no, no, that's the wrong thing. Okay, they had something sharp. They had a rat tail comb sticking in their mouth. I'm getting tired here, sorry. They had a rat tail comb in their mouth, the pointy end first, and they had the rear end collision, and they went forward and hit that rat tail comb on the steering wheel, and it poked it backward and it lacerated their oral pharynx and they have bleeding back there or it lacerated the soft palate and they're bleeding in their mouths we have to keep that suction out we have to get the blood out of the airway externally we can use 
direct pressure on the face. Internally, we just have to keep it suctioned out. Put them on their side. Um, if they're on a backboard and sea collar, prop the board up, and we have to keep them suctioned out. That is how you manage facial bleeding. That is how facial bleeding, if you have a full thickness laceration through the cheek, that's going to bleed a lot. I've seen that before. It does bleed a lot. Keep that blood suctioned out, but we have to keep them oxygenated at the same time, right? So we have to have them on their side so that blood pool, pools in their mouth so we can suction it out and blood doesn't pool in their oropharynx. Uh, these days, if that's significant enough and you call ALS, they will, will uh, sedate, paralyze, sedate and paralyze your patient with medications, and then they will intubate your patient and haul them away. All right, that is the airway chapter. Took longer than I thought it would. That covers it. Uh, it is there for you to watch. It will not be on your exam on Thursday. Only patient assessment will be on your exam Thursday. So you have plenty of time to watch this lecture. And then we'll have the two chapters that we lecture on on Thursday. And you'll have a three-chapter exam a week from today. All right, thanks, folks.